clap as loud as you can. And welcome Montgomeryville and Royersville, Plymouth meeting. Limerick, those of you watching online, go ahead and clap back at all of our camps and send some love to our church. Hey, last week uh, was incredible. How many were here for baptisms? It was, it was, some of you weren't here, you missed it. If you missed it, you missed it. Like there's just, there's, there's things that, there's things you can watch uh, and, and still get the full experience and there's things you have to be at to actually experience it. And last Sunday was one of those unique Sundays. Like I wish every Sunday was like that. We got a chance to baptize over 60 people at church, which that is the most people we baptize in about three or four years at once. And so that's something to clap about. Here, here's why. Sometimes the longer you do this, uh, the less likely you are to have moments like that because your church begins to get filled with people who just become apathetic. It's just the way that we are. Like we've been there, we've done that, uh, we've seen that. But when you exist for those not here and you continue to invite new people into the atmosphere and the community of your church, you get to experience stuff like, like last week. And here, here's the thought I had. Uh, many of you invited people. So a typical Sunday, we'll have between 11 and 1,200 people at Journey Church. Last week, we had almost 1,400 people show up at our church. We had 353 kids uh, at our church. And so it was an incredible, incredible day. 24 people responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ on a, on a baptism Sunday, which is incredible. And so like God did some cool things. And I thought to myself, what if we were as intense every week as we were with that week with inviting people to church? Like, What if we just did that Every, every week, we found a way to invite people into church that God, God did something in their lives, changed them forever, and he continued to reach, reach, reach this world. And so I want to encourage you as we go into this holiday season, and I say this almost every year, uh, the holiday season comes with a lot of expectations from people. It's also a very depressing time for many people, which means that it's a great time for the church to, to, to actually be the church. And so don't get wrapped up in all of your plans. Uh, what I mean is it's busy. We have Thanksgiving, we have travel, we have Christmas, we have New Year's, we have all these things going on. Uh, don't get so wrapped up in the, in the holiday season that you miss the God-appointed and ordained moments in your life to actually invite somebody into his presence. And so, uh, especially on Christmas Eve, and so we're going to have four Christmas Eve services right here in our Phoenixville campus. So all of our campuses are going to come together. And we're going to have all sorts of fun stuff for the, for the, for, for the kids. Santa Claus is going to be here, Mrs. Claus. We're going to read stories as they're walking in. We're going to have popcorn and movie for the, for the kids. We're going to have cookies, hot chocolate. Uh, we're going to sing lots of Christmas carols for those of you who are into that. Uh, and maybe you're not into that. You're like, I don't like Christmas carols. Listen, a lot of your friends that don't go to church for some reason like Christmas carols. And so we're going to have a good time with the Christmas carols. We're going to have a karaoke machine set up so people feel comfortable. So it reminds them of the Friday night out in the hallway. And so uh, we're going to have a good time together. And so start to make plans uh, to be a part of what's going on as we end out this year and go into 2020. Hey, we have two more weeks in our series called my kids are scary. I told you the last two weeks are kind of my, my favorite. Next week is my, is I'm looking forward to it because it's something I haven't talked on before. And the topic will be, I'm afraid or I'm scared that I've screwed my kid up. And I told you last week, I said, good news, bad news is you probably have already screwed your kid up in some way. Uh, but the, the good news is, uh, you're not supposed to be perfect. You're not their savior. That's why you have to lead them towards Jesus. And when they get to Jesus, uh, they'll experience grace and mercy. And when they get grace and mercy, the natural thing is to also give you grace and mercy. And if you're a parent, you know you need grace and you need mercy. You mess up from time to time. Many of us mess up every, every day. And so we're going to talk about that as some of you struggle with, with the, the, those feelings, that, that shame that maybe you struggle with, that you really drop the ball in your parenting. Today, I want to talk to you about expectations. The title of my message is, I'm afraid to set high expectations. You see, we live in a world that is afraid to expect things of kids and really of each other. We're, we're afraid to set high expectations. We think if we set high expectations, that, that kids are, are going to cower under those, that they're going to feel the weight of those, the pressure of those, and they're actually going to go backwards. We, we think that and so we live in a culture that mimics kind of the old Mad TV skit. You ever see Mad TV where they did the lowered expectations? If you didn't watch that, you can go on YouTube and check it out. It's hard to see because it's blurry because it's the quality of it. But they did this skit where it was this dating thing. It was the lowered expectations. And the tagline of it was, uh, when you've been blown off by the rest, it's okay, just settle for second best. And I think that we live in a culture like that. I think we live in a culture that's scared for, f to set those high expectations. And so we've lowered them, and many of us don't even realize how we've lowered them. And so I, I did some research this week, and I, and I just found some different ways that, that parents, myself and you, that we've kind of lowered expectations without even knowing it. You know, there was a time in the history of parenting where, where you put something in front of a kid, and they didn't have the option. They just had to eat it. That was all they were going to get, right? And so they started, the thing I read, it was like, just take, for instance, vegetables. What do parents say about vegetables? My kid won't. Do what? 
He won't eat vegetables. What, what, what does the majority of parents like me say? What do they like? They only eat, come on, everybody knows this, chicken nuggets and french fries. They won't eat vegetables. No, no, no. You haven't expected them to eat vegetables. Because there was a time where you didn't eat vegetables, you just didn't eat, right? There wasn't processed food. Uh, there wasn't all these other elements of people being uh, uh, unhealthy. Like, you just had to eat what you were given. Some of us grew up in a house like that. I remember that feeling of giving, being given Brussels sprouts or something like that, and just the option was not there to not. I remember how scared I was of dinner in my life because I knew my grandma was old school. She was cooking something that I absolutely despised, and I was going to have to figure out a way to hide it in my pocket and throw it away in the trash later. I had all sorts of ways to get out of that, but it was still a, a fight. Like, no, you're going to eat what's on your plate, but we, 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 my, my kids don't eat. What do we, no, we haven't expected them to eat. Another one that I read this week is pull-up diapers. Parents, the, the new thing now is one of the, one of the, one of the biggest uh, money makers in, 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 in parenting for, for manufacturers is pull-up diapers. In other words, uh, diapers for 30-pound kids now. And, so, uh, and what happens is, is in the old days, people had to wash the, the diapers, right? And so literally they were one year old. You're like, you got to stop crapping in this diaper. This is disgusting, right? <laughs> but now they made disposable diapers. And, so, and, and the thing is, if, if you can crap yourself and it's not that big of a deal... I mean, all of us are like, I'd probably do that too. <laughs> like, I waste a lot of my life going to the bathroom. I'm 40 years old, right? Like, it's, it's like a common thing. Like, every hour, I gotta go pee, right? If I could just put on a diaper and, and it would be okay. And so we have, we have kids that are four or five years old, and it's like you potty train your kid when they're what? When they're ready. Don't, don't. And, and I get it because we're busier now. But the truth is we've just lowered the expectations. The kids can still get potty trained at a fairly young age. Kids will still eat vegetables if you make them. Kids can still work. Kids can still do chores. Kids can still make eye contact with people. Kids can still behave at a restaurant. Kids can do all these things. We just don't expect them to do it. And then here's the problem. Oftentimes, uh, parenting is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so you get what you expect. You, you get from your... Some of you are so tired of your kids. You're tired of picking up messes. You're tired of cleaning up after dinner. You're tired of fussy eaters. You're, you're, you're tired of whatever you're tired of. I get it. Me too. I'm tired of them not putting their towel back on the hook. I'm tired of them breaking things. I'm tired. Just last night, I'm preaching on expectations. Very end of the night, I hear, Shh, they come upstairs. They broke something, right? They're pointing their fingers like this in the house. They broke something. One of my pictures is on the thing, and I think to myself, like, I, I have to do a better job of expecting certain things from my, my kids. And so I want to talk to you about the significance of setting expectations. And I really have two things before I get into the points I want you to remember. One is the expectations you're, you set determine the reality you're going to get someday. The expectations you set right now determine the reality you're going you're gonna to get one day. Let's just play it out in a few different scenarios. If you're, if you're dating somebody and you want to have a good marriage and you want to be married to somebody who's responsible and you want to be married to somebody who pays their bills on time and you want to be married to somebody who's going to be a good spouse, then whoever you're currently dating, what you're expecting and what you're allowing is going to determine that. And so I, I meet people that are like, my husband's a little boy. Like he doesn't, he doesn't want to help around the house. And I'm like, well, was he like that when you dated him? Well, yeah. I just thought marriage would change him. And I'm like, no, no, you should have changed the expectations you set because they would have determined the reality that you, you, would have, you, would, you would have got. Some of you are run a business and you can't get anybody to come on time. The standards, expectations of what you say. You don't expect them to come on time. You, know, you let people have jobs that show up late. You let people not do their job. And then all of a sudden your, your business is failing. And I would tell you, change your expectations. The expectations you set determine the realities you get. So if you look at your kids and you don't like the reality that you're facing, what do you got to do? you got to change what you've been expecting of them. And the second thing is this, is the expectations you set in their lives are telling them about the expectations you see for their lives. And this one's important because you don't know it and I don't know it. But when you fail to set expectations for them, what you're really telling them is you don't have anything of value to give to this world. You're actually stealing from them confidence. When you don't expect them to make their bed, when you don't expect them to do their laundry, when you don't expect them to pack their own lunch, when you don't expect them to go to college and actually get a job, and I know they're busy, they're taking 15 credit hours, and they're super busy, right, and they got a full, full, full schedule, and you don't expect them to go work a little bit and make some, some money, and you pay for their car and their insurance, and, their, and you have a teenager, and they have an iPhone 11, you know, 13 or whatever's out now, and you pay for that for them, and you give them unlimited text, and you don't expect them to get a job and to, and, to, and to contribute. You are actually taking something from them. 
The expectations you set for them tell you the expectations you see for them. And here's what I want to do. I want to show you the potential that God says is inside of them. Because this is about enabling them, expecting them to reach their potential. This isn't about pressure. That's different. I'm not telling you to put so much pressure onto your kid that they're going to cave under the weight of your expectations. I'm not telling your kid's going to be perfect. If, you, if you're a parent, you know that. What I am saying is, do you know the potential inside of them? I want to take you to a verse in the book of Ephesians 3, and I want to read it with you. And the reason I want to start in verse number 18 is because it's, it, it goes back to the, chapter, to, to, to the first part of this sermon series, week number one. Watch what he says, uh, that you have, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and deep and high the love of God is, and that you would know that love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. So we want you to experience a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you begin to understand that, the Bible says this, now when you get filled, now to him who is able to do what? immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. In, in, in other words, what God's telling you is your child has the potential to change this world. So the expectations you're setting on them are telling them all about that potential. And God says, if you get filled with me, if you know the, the knowledge of the love, how, how deep it is, how wide it is, you get filled with that, that your potential is to change this world. And so I wrote in my notes, if God tells us that our kids have the potential to change this world, we should probably stop treating them that they, don't have, that they can't change their own laundry. We should probably stop that. We should probably set higher expectations expectations on them so that they will reach their potential so let me just give you five things and we could probably give a list of probably a hundred but let me just give you five things if you're a parent you should write these down because here's the thing about it it's easier to do it yourself you ever do anything with your kids don't they slow it down you ever try to teach them how to clean up and you're like just get out of here in my house, I'm like, you got to sweep the floor up when you're, done, when you're done eating. Sweep the floor up every day. I have spent a vast majority of my life with the broom in my hand over the last decade, right? Sweep, sweep it up, sweep it up, sweep it up. And they don't do it, and you go over to talk to them about it, but instead of showing them how to do it, you just get out of the way. Just, and, and they're just watching, and you're like, sweet, I got what I wanted. You ever try to, try to shovel? It's freezing outside today, by the way. Looks like snow. Too early to snow, right? You ever shovel with your kids? It's torture. And I get it. It's easier just to do it yourself. You ever, you ever tell your kid no? And they have a fit, and you're like, something's going to buy it, so you shut up. It starts when they're really little, when they have a binky. And they want that binky, you're like, shh. shh. And then they reach for something else, you just give them whatever they want. Just be quiet. They don't want to sit in their high chair. What do you do? You get Every first time parent. Right? He makes a fuss. Just bounce around. Just keep them quiet. I get it. It's easier to live like that. But here's the thing. The expectations you set determine the type of person they're going to be. And you are telling them every time what you think they could become in their life. And their potential, the Bible says, is immeasurable. They could change the world when they know Jesus Christ. Let me just give you five things. One is this. Let me give you some just right expectations. It's right to expect their best effort. This is a really really important word. Because here's how we mess it up when I talk about expectations. Some of you have ridiculously too high expectations. Let me give you some classic examples. Uh, your kid's not that good at sports. They're just not. You, you weren't that athletic. You know a lot about sports, but you, they don't know you never really played. You have a letter jacket, but you, you know you got that from Goodwill, right? <laughs> and now you have a kid, and you're like, I, listen, the reason, and I, the reason that that I wasn't good is because my, you know, my parents weren't invested in it, and, and, and I never got the right coach and right opportunity. If I would have just got the right opportunity, I would throw that ball over that mountain over there. And so, like, I never, I never got it. And so now you have a kid, and you're putting the pressure on them to be the best player on every team. And every time they get into your car, and they weren't the best player at the game, you're, you're drilling them. You're showing them plays. You get your notepad out. You're Xing and Oing stuff. Meanwhile, they're just chomping on their Doritos at the end of it with the Capri Sun. And your expectations, I want you to be smart. Or, or let's, maybe, maybe you're not an athlete. You're like, I don't care about sports. Maybe, maybe you're really into books and, and, and being smart. And you're like, I expect you to get straight A's. I expect you to, to be successful. You're not an AP. What are you? You're dumb. Hold on a second. What, 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 what reading group are you in? What's wrong with you? Are you even studying? You better study. 
I got straight A's. I got triple A's, right? I did it all, and you expect them to get straight A's. And then there's the two low parents. You know what I'm talking about? They're just happy their kid's awake. <laughs> In sports, you're like, it's okay. Just, I'm, I'm glad you're out there participating, you're running around, twirling, you know, pushing your friend over, hugging people. It's okay. I'm, meanwhile, they're hurting the whole team by being out there. You ever been that? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're out there, and they're having fun, but the rest of the team is suffering because of them. You're like, it's okay. Good job, Jimmy. It's always Jimmy, right? <laughs> Billy. Good job, Billy, right? Way to run. He ain't running. He's just standing there. <laughs> oh, almost. And you're just happy that they're awake or they're in school. You're like, you're like, I'm just happy you got up this morning. You got a D, whatever. And they have all this potential, and they're not getting D's because they're not, because they're, they're not smart or they don't have a brain. They're getting D's because they don't try. But you're like, eh. There's, there's what I would call just right expectations, and it's an effort thing. You know what the effort thing is? This is the conversation. Hey, I don't expect you to be the best player on your team, but I do expect you to be the one that hustles the most. I do want you to give effort. I want you to run off and on the field. I want you to be the one who gives them. That's the only, you can't control your athletic ability. For my kids, I can't control right now that, that you're white and you're short, right? I can't control that. I pray all the time. Grow. Be tall, right? But right now, you're, you're kind of you're, you're, you're short, right? Uh, and so you can give the most effort, though. You, 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 can, you can outrun everybody. You can run on and off that field. Effort is something you can control, right? If you're in school, man, man my, my son, this is the first year he's in middle school. That stuff is actually hard. Remember that reality? And he's in, he's in pre-algebra because he did good in, in fifth grade, and so he's in pre-algebra, and he's doing all, good in all of his classes except for one. He has a B. And he doesn't know. Like he, I haven't told him about my career at school. Like a B was my dream. And so he's beating himself up, and I'm like, listen, man, listen, you're in pre-algebra. I got to algebra one when I was in college. <laughs> I can tell you where I was at. So here's what I want. I want you to give effort. And he said, well, he said, what does that look like? I said, well, you tend to rush through your problems, and you've kind of been, been able to do that through elementary school. And so maybe now you've got to take your time. You can't be the first person done on a test. Just give your best effort. If you get a B, if you get a C, whatever it is, as long as I know you gave your best effort. And I've got I to tell you, you should start teaching your kid that. We should teach our kids to, to, to out-effort people. They can't control everything, but they can control what I would call effort. Expect them to accomplish large and small tasks with the same, with the same effort. I, I remember being in this building. I was reflecting this week on what God did and then thinking about how we were in this building just uh, six years ago, renovating it and thinking about the good stuff that God has done in this room. And I work with this guy named Mike, this contractor, and he said to me, uh, one time we were talking about the way he works and the way we work, and you know we we have, we kind of cut corners sometimes, and you know does that need to have a, a lag in the wall, or can we just put the screw in there and hope it stays there and stuff like that? And so he's telling me he was sitting me down. And he said, "There's one way to do things. There's just one way. There's the right way. There's there's not there's not a bunch of ways. There's just one way to do it." And he was talking about effort. You put the effort in, and you do things the right way at the right time and with the right heart. It's actually a biblical thing, even though he would tell you he doesn't believe in God. It's what I will call godly character. It's this effort thing. Now, watch what Scripture says in Colossians 3. Whatever you do, what are you supposed to do? Work at it with all of your heart. That's an effort word. If you're a parent, you should put that somewhere in your house. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as if you're working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that, you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are. Serving. When you're running off on, that, on and off that soccer field, it's actually Jesus you're representing. When you're studying hard for your test, that's actually Jesus that you're representing. Whatever you do, bring your best effort. Bring your best effort. No, number, number two, let me just run through these quickly. It's right to expect them. Here's a good one for some of us. It's right to expect them to learn to earn. I get it. It's so, it's so much funner just to buy them something. The look on their face, the gifts, just give them. Just, just give them the new phone. Just, just give them the new shoes. My, my, my son came home last week. I can't keep up with styles, right? And he's like, Dad, fanny packs are in style for men. And I'm like, what? <laughs> the world am I living in? And he starts telling me about it. Yeah, you get the, the champion one or savage or something like that. And he was like, they don't wear them around their, around their, their, their waist, though. Because, you know, how do you make a fanny pack core than wearing it around? You wear it around kind of like a strap around, around your, your thing here. I was, like, you're, I was like, dudes are wearing purses at school now? And he was like, no. And I was like, what are you keeping it? You know, like your phone and like your, your phone and stuff like that. <laughs> 
And we went out somewhere, and he was like, this, see that? Look, this fanny pack. And everything inside me was like, I'll buy it for you. Even though you're not going to wear this in two months, because you're going to realize how dorky this is, right? <laughs> and I thought to myself, why would I buy this for you right now? Because I'm teaching you a really, a really stupid lesson. Instant gratification. The ability just to get whatever you want, which we know as adults, if you live like that, you're probably in massive debt. You, 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 probably, you probably live in paycheck. You just buy whatever you want. I want to teach my kids something other than instant happiness. Instant happiness is fun. It's rewarding. But the best gift I can give my kids is teaching them how to earn, how to save, how, how to use money wisely. In fact, I remember years ago, we were in the Exton Mall, and it was the, the fountain was there, and you throw money into the fountain. And when I was a kid, I always wanted to throw my parents' money into the fountain. And so I had kids, and I'm like, I don't want you throwing my money into this fountain. Like, don't throw my money in, in, into the fountain. And they were like, why not? What, what are we supposed to do? It's a, it's a fountain. And I was like, well, listen, listen. I know you make a wish in this fountain, but here's the thing. Uh, wishes don't make anything come true. If you want to actually be successful, be a hard worker. And you know what they figured out? They figured out that people were so bad at throwing money into that fountain, there was actually money scattered all around that fountain in the bushes. You said, you know what we started doing? Instead of throwing money, it went on treasure hunts, right? And they'd be digging in, digging people's wishes up and making it their dreams, right? And, and they started making money. And I thought to myself, I'm going to teach them. I'm going to teach them how to work, work hard. Teach your kids the value of hard work. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. If you have young children, teach them how to earn. A couple years ago, my kids love shoes. They don't, they don't like the cheap shoes. They like the expensive shoes. And they wanted to go to Foot Locker and spend $75 on a pair of shoes. And it was summertime, and they were talking talk about the shoes that they wanted. And I said, listen, there's about 30 days left in the summer, 35 days. If you want a pair of shoes, I'm going to let you have the opportunity to earn $2 a day. They said, Dad, that's, that's, that's going to be $60. I said, exactly. And you can go to Ross, or you can go to TJ Maxx, or you can go on Amazon. But what, whatever you do, I'm not going to give you $2. You're going to come to me, and you're going to say, I'm ready to earn $2, and I'll give you a job. And we'll earn $2 a day. Let me tell you something. You know what shoes they took care of the most in their life? Those are the shoes they bought. I buy them shoes. They're out in the mud running around in them. They bought them. They're in, my, my, they're in the, 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 like the, way, the wash sink, or the, the thing, and they're washing them off. I'm like, what are you doing? These little, these are idle. They're like, Dad, we bought these with our own money. I'm like, well, technically it was my money. <laughs> But you bought it because you earned it, right? If you have, you have young kids, teach them how to earn. Give them, give them chores. If you have teens, make them pay for stuff. Make him, the best thing my dad did is when I was 13, he found me a job somewhere. And I don't know if it was legal or if it was sweatshop stuff, but he taught me, he taught me to get a job with your kids, teach them that. Man, we've been doing this with our, with our, with our son Carter. He's been going to the, to the cafeteria and getting lunch every day. And I told him, I said, listen, the first day was $8 for your lunch. $8. I said, you're not going to Panera Bread. You're going to the Phoenixville Middle School. It's two seventy, dollars right? And I'm going to watch it. And we watched it, and he spent two seventy dollars on Friday. We let, him, we, let him go, we let him go big. We let him get a Snapple or something like that. And that's the only day. And then I, in, in October, his birthday was coming. He knew he was going to get some money. And uh, so his money's coming. He's, 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 he's getting ready for that. And we just happened, his, his account is, gets automatically deposited every, every week, his money. And so we put it in there. He can get lunch. And we just noticed it started to go faster than it was supposed to go. So we got on there. And it, 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 he, he, like, he followed instructions until the beginning of uh, October. And it was October, October 15th, something like that. And on October 1st, right around there, end of September, he started to buy an extra thing every day, thinking we wouldn't notice. <laughs> and then we noticed because the Bible says your sins always find you out. <laughs> that's, one of those, that's one of those Jesus jukes, parents use, right? And he spent about $25 more than he was supposed to spend in the, those three weeks. You know what we made him do? Take your birthday money. You pay for this. You know what he hasn't done since then? You don't want to waste his money on Snapples. T teach him the value of earning things. College kids, teach them the value of working. Teach them to learn to earn. Don't give them everything they, they want. You're setting them up for a life of failure and debt. Let me just give you quickly th three more. It's right to expect them to be contributors to your team. I think about this often. Am I, am I raising little kings and queens, or, or am I raising somebody who's part of a team? And then I ask myself this question. Is the kid that I'm raising, am I going to be happy for the person that they're marrying? Am I going to say, you're welcome, or am I going to say, I'm sorry to them? I'm sorry. I'm sorry they don't know, they don't know how to help around the house. I'm sorry my boys you know, are just boys. I'm sorry that you basically have a third child here. 
I'm sorry that they don't know how to clean. I'm sorry that they don't know how to cook. I'm sorry that, that they don't do any of those things. And I think to myself, I don't want to pass off somebody like that. And I certainly wasn't passed off like that to my, to my wife. And so it, it's okay for you to expect them to contribute to, to the team, a.k.a. if you don't understand what the team is, the team is you, and what I'm talking about is a little bit of chores. Like it's somewhere in the Bible. Do L chores, right? <laughs> like clean up after yourself. Be contributors to, to the team. Like, like be a part of keeping the house. When I try to teach my kids this, they're like, why is it a big deal? I'm like, because we're a team. And when you don't do what you're supposed to do and help around the house and pick up and clean and put your own washing and all these things, then our team doesn't function. And I started thinking about that picture. Well, what happens when we don't function together? When we have less time to actually spend with, with each other because we're constantly cleaning up after the animals that we have. When that happens, mommy and daddy are more stressed out because we've worked all day and now we're cleaning up after our kids and you're not helping. And then you tend to get on our nerves because we're doing this and we're listening to you fight. And the reason you're fighting is because you have nothing to do. And when you give little kids nothing to do, they beat each other up. That's what they do. And so you're creating heck. And here's, the, here's what eat for me personally, not only does it affect that, it affects the church. Because we have less time as we're kind of not cleaning up to get, or cleaning up and not being a team. Less time to dream and think about the church and take care of the needs of the church and less time to take care of the needs of the family because we're busy taking care of these little animals. And when we all contribute together, when we're blessings, not burdens, when we're contributors, not consumers, man, it's more than just chores. We get to function at a higher level. It's okay for you to expect them to contribute to your team. And let me just give you two more. I know I have five, and I need to move fast through them. No, no, number four is this. It's, it's, it's right to expect them. This is an important one for us, one that's gotten forgotten, but one that is so significant. And, Laurel, you can come play us out if we're wrapping this up. But it's right to expect them to honor others. What, 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 is, what is the younger generation struggling with? Dishonor. Why? Because we struggle with dishonor. You know what's sad about when you don't teach your kids to honor? There's a scripture in the Bible. I don't have it in the notes, but there's a, it's a promise in scripture. And what does it say? Honor who? Your father and mother. And the promise is that you'll live a long, healthy life. Isn't that, a weird, isn't that amazing? Like, that's, that's, like honor your father and mother. Not, not respect them. So like, I didn't like my parents. You know, they were bad people. Honor your father and mother. Honor them. Uh, and the promise is you'll live a long, he healthy life. I don't know exactly how that looks and plays out. But I know honor is really important to, 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 to God, and it, it should be important to you as a parent. T teach them to, to honor. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. In, in, our, in, our, in our day and age, it would be the king or the, the president, I mean. That, that sucks for a lot of us. We're like, I don't like him. It doesn't matter if you like him as the last president, president before. I don't know if you ever noticed. Nobody likes the president ever. You know why? Because he's the leader. If you're the leader, you'll always be hated. That's why nobody wants to do it. It says honor. Sh show, show your kids what it looks like to honor. I started thinking about what honor looks like. Teach them to make eye contact with adults. Isn't that a missing thing in a lot of our kids? Like, not, not little kids. Like, I'm talking about, like, teenagers. They got the headphones in, right? They're walking around the mall. They go up to the cash register. Somebody's checking them out. They got the AirPods. They don't even need wires anymore. And they're just doing their thing. And just and you're, what? It's five ninety nine. What? Mom, it's five ninety nine. Right? And they don't look up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach my kids, and you should teach your kids honor honor adults by making eye contact with them. Don't allow your kids to always be on their phones in public when people are trying to talk to them. Teach them to say these words. Ready? Thank you. Th thank you. Th thank you for what you've done. Teach them to be quiet and respectful in public, understanding that though they are cute, the world doesn't revolve around them. That, I know that's probably offensive to some of you, but I, I'm just telling you, I took out my, my soccer team, they're all 12 year olds, and uh, I love them to death, but at the end of it, I was like, you got to go home. And I, me and my son went to Redner's after we went to pizza, and, and he was like, dad, that was crazy. I was like, yeah. I was like, it was crazy. And I was like, listen, that's why we teach honor. I said, because everybody else in that restaurant wasn't there for them. But it was almost like that was like that was it. Like they, they, were, they were making obscene gestures and saying things they shouldn't say and, and making a mess. And when they left, I could just feel the entire restaurant go, now we can enjoy our delicious, unhealthy pizza. And I thought to myself, man, how sad is it? How sad is it that we don't teach our kids 
to honor others and that they are not the center of the world. The Bible is really clear about, about honor, teaching to respect others by being on time. But here's the thing about that. They're not going to be on time if you're never on time, church people. They're just, they're just not. I know you're busy and all that stuff. Clean up the mess you make at a restaurant. Be somebody who honors others. Teach them to honor others. And let me just give you, let me just give you one more. And this one's really important. Because what I'm not saying is perfection. Your kids are not going to be perfect. We're, they're far from it, and you are far from perfect. But number five is this. It's right to expect them to be a work in progress. A, a work in progress. There's two things I always tell, tell myself when it comes to parenting. Two things that I, that I that go back to often. Two words that start with the C because it helps me to remember them. First one is this. is stay consistent. Stay, stay consistent. And so here's what I mean. When you have expectations, as soon as your expectations aren't consistent, they're no longer expectations. They're a pipe dream. So you have to be consistent. If you expect them to be on time, if you expect them to pick up, if you expect them. But here's the thing about it. You're going to have to have that conversation a million. You ever find yourself, how many times am I going to tell you to put your bowl in the sink? You ever had that? And you get so mad, you're like, I just give up. I got the worst kids in the world. Here's what I would ask you, because you are a, a child of God. How many times has God told you not to worry? And you're still worried here right now, right as I'm talking. How many times has God told you to be consistent with your finances and trust him? And you are still inconsistent. How, how many times, and here's the thing about it, and he's still okay with you. He still loves you. He still has a plan for you. So you need to expect your kids to be a work in progress. But if you want expectations to settle in and affect them, you got to be consistent. And number two, you got to be confident in yourself. Because you're going to live in a world where there is no expectations for anyone. None. There, there is none. Like you're gonna, your kids are going to be around other kids and they're going to get whatever they want. If it's new, they're going to have it and you're going to walk by and you're almost going to feel like a bad parent. Like when I walk by and my son's like, dad, everybody has a phone but me. And I'm like, you got a phone. It just stays at home so you can call us. What else do you need to do on it? I don't need you looking at porn. I don't need you texting people. I don't need you on that phone. Just call us and let us know you're home safe and stay there. You're safe. And sometimes you feel bad. You're like, oh, I'll just give it to you. It's going to be car time. He's already started to work me over. Dad, this, this, this high school kid, he has a brand new Mustang, he told me. And I was like, well, you see that 2007 Jeep Commander sitting in our driveway with all these scratches on it for you? That's your future, buddy. <laughs> Unless you get a job, that's your future. Call, what? What? Like, you got to just stay confident in the way you parent. Everybody parents a little different. Be consistent and be confident. Watch this verse. I love this verse in Philippians 1. Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. That you and me as parents, that we are works in progress. We're far from perfect. And your kids, it's right to expect them to be a work in in progress. Would you do me a favor? Would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes all over this house? See, the truth is, expectations are significantly important. They're building confidence in your kid's life right now. They're telling you, telling him what you believe that he can do, she can do, she can accomplish. And so if you don't like what you're seeing, Change what you're expecting. Change what you're expecting because your kid can do it. There is more in your kid than you can even imagine. That's what the Bible says, that they would figure out and experience the fullness of God, a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And in that God, that they're able to do immeasurably more than they could ever imagine, that you could ever imagine, that they have the potential to impact and to change this world. Here's the thing, though. You need to raise your expectations for them so they believe what God has placed inside of them. They, they see it. They understand it. They grasp it. It's significant. Change your ex expectations. And as we're, 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 we're kind of wrapping this up, and some of you, you know, I, I know for me, when I, when I preach through parenting, I, I, I evaluate a lot. I change a lot. I mess up a lot. It seems like, it seems like the pressure is even more because I realize what's on the line, and then I mess up even more, and, and I got to go back and... and, and 
kind of change it up, and I'm a work in progress. Like, that's, that's what I am. I'm telling my kids, I'm a work in progress. I'm probably never going to figure this out completely, but I'm going to work my tail off to do it. I'm never going to throw in the towel. I'm never going to quit on you. I'm never going to give up on you. I'm a, I'm a work in progress, as you are as well. And I, I want to encourage you today to hear that from God, because some of you, like, you, 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 you started to follow God, and some of you got baptized last week, and, like, you're, like, on cloud nine, and then you fell this week, man. You messed up. You fell short of the glory of God. You needed that same grace that you experienced when you first got saved. And, and the mistake for many of us is in that mindset, uh, we begin to be afraid that we've, we've, we've gone too far, done too much, let God down. The Bible says that he's a God that is faithful to complete the work that he started. And he's faithful to keep going. And he knows that we are a work in progress. The Bible calls us sanctification. The process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. And we are, we're not perfect people, that we're a work in progress. Some of you started coming to church, but you've never given your life to Christ. Some of you have given your life to Christ, but you've never taken those next steps. And now you're, you're going backwards, and you feel like maybe you've gone too far. You've done too much. You've been away too long. But God's a God that's faithful. God's a God that never gives up on us. I'll say it often in church, if your heart's still beating, God has a good plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And he does have high expectations for you because he created you and made you and formed you and molded you and put gifts and talents and abilities in you. And he has a very specific purpose and plan for your life. He wants to build his kingdom and accomplish things through you for his glory. Here's the thing about it. If you're in that that that, that, that mindset right now where, man, you, you've messed up and you're, you're kind of away from God or you're feeling disciplined by God because you don't feel his presence. The Bible says God disciplines those he loves. Discipline, the point of it is to reconnect you with him, to bring you back to him. And so maybe you're going through the consequences of your decisions. The thing about God is he is he's never far from you. He is always with you. He will never leave you, the Bible says, and he will never turn his back on you. He's here right now. And I, I felt a very strong, strong word in my heart as I prepared this message. Sometimes you're like, how do I end a message with a call to receive Christ? But I felt, I felt a very strong call, a sense that there would be somebody here today that you, you've kind of wandered away from your relationship with God. It's not where it, it was. Like the thing about a relationship is it's either going forward or it's going backwards. And you've gone really far backwards and you've wondered if you could ever get back to where you were before. It's been so long since you felt his presence and so long since you felt his love and so long since you were passionate about the things of God and you've wondered maybe is God done with you? Maybe it's over. God is faithful to complete the work. And part of that work is, is refinery. To burn things out of your life that enable you to understand what it feels like, man, to kind of walk away in apathy, but to be brought back, to understand the extent of his love and his mercy and his grace for you. And I just felt like there was somebody here today, maybe multiple people, that you would say, hey, that's me. I've wandered away from God. I'm not, I don't even really have a relationship with him anymore. I know him in my mind, and, I, and I've been to church in my life, but I don't have a relationship with God. And then I know, as always, there's other people here who don't really have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible talks a lot about repenting. And that happens before you're a Christian, you repent, but it also happens after you're saved. And the, the, the word repentance just simply means to turn, turn back, to, 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 to walk back, to turn your life back to, to Jesus, to receive him as your Lord and your Savior, to ask him to forgive your sin, to ask him to heal your apathetic, hardened heart. So I don't know who you are today at our campuses right now. I don't know everybody by name. I don't know you at our other campuses at all. But I know that God does. He loves you more than you can imagine. He knew exactly where you were going to be, exactly what seat you were going to sit in. He knew exactly what message you were, were going to hear. He knew how we were going to end this sermon. And he has been doing a work in your heart. And I would love the opportunity to pray with you. So for some of you, it's to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior for the very first time. And others of you, you just need to turn back. You need to take what was once yours, that you've allowed to be taken from you, that fire that you've had, 
that desire that you had to know Christ, that passion you had for his church. You've kind of wandered away and you've become lukewarm or apathetic and you just need to turn back. God's closer than you think. He's been tapping on your shoulder the whole time. Hey, where, where are you going? What are you doing? You're really going to go back to the old way, the, 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 way you, the way you lived before, the thought life you had, the habits that you, that you created, that you live with? Don't go back. And he's been tapping at your shoulder. And right now he's screaming at you. He's screaming, turn around. Come back. Come back to where it first started. I love you. I'll never stop loving you. I'll never give up on you. I felt like there was going to be somebody here today. Somebody that needed to hear that and needed to respond to that. And so here's what we do at our, our church as we get ready to close and go about our business on this Sunday is we respond kind of with a line in the sand moment. And that line in the sand moment is kind of raising your hand in the air when I ask you at all of our campuses. If you're at our other campus, they're going to let me know on screen in the back that, that that is you. And when you do that, we're just going to pray together. Not some long, ridiculous religious prayer. Just simply, Jesus, come into my life. Be the Lord of everything that I am. I turn back to you. Forgive my sins. Set me free. For some of you, you already have a relationship, but it's growing dim. He's going to light that fire in your life again. He's going to enable you to have courage to break away from the habits and the steps that you've taken away from him. And you're going to turn back to him right now. That love that you once had is going to come back. That hope that you once had is going to fill your life. That joy that you had the moment that you got saved, that joy is going to come back into your life. That peace, that peace is here right now. So if you're here all over our campuses and you say, hey, that's me. I need to either get my life right with Christ or I need to receive him as my Lord and Savior right now. I know God's already been working. If that's you, I just want you to quickly slip your hand right up in the air. I'm not going to make you come forward. I see a hand way, way, way in the back. Is there anybody else? Say, hey, Pastor, that's me. That's me. I'm going to slip my hand straight up, and I'm going to bring it right back down, and I'm going to recognize you, and we're going to pray. I see another hand right here. Is there anybody else? Say, hey, Pastor, that's me. I'm returning back. I'm returning back. Maybe, maybe you don't need to get saved, but maybe you need to give your life back to God. In Limerick, we're going to clap with the person in Limerick right now. Yes, yes, as people continue to respond, let's pray together all over our houses. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, for it never returns void. Thank you that even through a very specific topic like parenting, that we ultimately are being parented by the perfect heavenly father. And you're drawing people to yourself. You love us in a way that we don't deserve. You're compassionate, the Bible says, and slow to anger. You never give up on us. Lord, you're closer than we can even imagine. And right now you are changing people forever, Lord. As we continue to focus on this parenting thought, Lord, we thank you for your representation and for your example in our lives. You're the perfect parent. You discipline perfectly. You have expectations set in our lives in a perfect manner. You guide us, the Bible says, in a perfect way. You love us perfectly. Perfectly. And Lord, as we experience that, Lord, we give that away to our kids, our world, our neighbors, everybody we come into contact with. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done here today. Thank you, Lord, for moving week in and week out. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey, one more time, church, would you shout amen? Come on, let's clap together all over our houses.